in uh, the 30s, science fiction fans were cellar Christians. We knew the whole world was against, against us, and we huddled together so we could talk to each other because there was no one else we could talk to. And actually, cellar is the right word because most of the clubs were held in someone's basement. In order to start a science fiction club, you needed a house with a basement. We knew each other better than we knew our own families. Uh, I have never been afflicted with false modesty, or, or true modesty either for that matter. And so I might as well say that during the 1940s, I wrote robot stories uh, as an example of engineer-oriented science fiction. And the foundation stories, which were rather in the older tradition of the wide-spanning galactic romance, uh, both were more successful in later time than they were at the moment. That's why I say through hindsight, looking back now, it seems to me that I was a major entry in the race then, although at the time, I must admit, I was never aware of being anything but a minor writer. He is trying to perfect the human uh, Nale Superman who's able to be telekinetic, telepathic, have these abilities to, to repel this anticipated alien invasion. And he does. He does ultimately do all these things through a series of uh, incidents that uh, may or may not all be uh, thoroughly explained at the end. I found him in that respect entrancing in his view of history, which I've come to believe is the essential science in science fiction. He romped through history. He romped through it, and even though he didn't make any jokes, the touch was a very light one. A man who could talk about large historical movements with a kind of repressed giggle. That was Sprague de Camp, and he could write about it that way, too. It was at the time of World War II, and I was uh, terribly disillusioned with what the human race was doing to itself. And I was uh, extremely upset at the idea that we could continue to use war as a matter of national policy. I was uh, upset by man's inhumanity to man. We were hearing about Dachau and, and, and some of the other camps. And uh, so I tried, to, I tried to create a world that would be the kind of a world I'd want to live in. And I've always often said, uh, without really meaning it, I think, that I made a world of dogs because you couldn't make that kind of a world and fill it with, fill it with human beings. Well, Clark comes off as being the reasonable man. Clark's science fiction is hopeful. Well, that's that's too broad a generalization because he's written some dark things too. But by and large, he thinks that human invention is going to be dominant over human perversity. I really think that he got underestimated. I think that uh, he was a wonderful writer. Had, a, had novel concepts and uh, he could turn a phrase and present great characterizations, and I don't think he ever got the uh, esteem or the money that he should have gotten. Well, as soon as I see the test, I know what it is because I've gotten these goddamn letters. I know what it is, exactly. And it's a story by... Uh, <laughs> Lester Del Rey was hired by Meredith at one point to write a bad story that you criticized called Rattlesnake Cave. I've always wanted to put that thing in an anthology <laughs> somewhere, but Lester is dead, he wouldn't appreciate it anymore. The thing that strikes you about the literary writers is that each one was working more or less by himself, uh, apart from all the others, whereas the commercial writers at this time were building up a set of shared assumptions, the widespread use of space travel, the galactic empire, and even a set of shorthand terms, a kind of jargon, hyperdrive, space warp, and so on which helped them get on with their stories, but repelled and irritated the literary writers and readers even more. I must have met him on July 2nd, 1939, <coughs> the first day of the Wilcon, and he talked about me, and I wasn't too anxious. I said, I only handle professionals, but he pleaded with me. So I said, all right, send me your stories, and I'll see what I could do. And he kept sending me stories and stories and stories. 
they are limited to, I think, something like 41 spells, which are ancient, which were discovered long ago. And nobody is discovering new spells, and nobody really knows how to go about researching new spells. And so they have the excellent prismatic spray, which is, is a grand spell if you want to kill somebody who's near at hand. The kind of spells that they need, something that would enable them to leave Earth or something that would enable them to renew the life of the sun, they haven't got. When I was teaching at New Mexico Military Institute years ago, I was sort of surprised to discover that she was the favorite author of the Cadet Corps. Of course, that is not another gender-specific name. She wrote very successfully and wrote, wrote material that was accessible to many readers. I, I'm not sure that I could handle it very well. I had a rather Victorian upbringing, regard sex as a private matter. On the other hand, there is a marine worm which reproduces as it crawls along the ocean bottom by grabbing onto something firmly with its hind legs and keeping crawling with the front ones and pulling itself apart. And I, ha in recent uh, months, have been wondering uh, if the Mesconites re reproduced that way, what would they regard as pornography? What we as readers want are the simultaneous senses of newness and of rightness. We want the author to take the building blocks he has laid out before our eyes and make them into something we would never have imagined for ourselves. The world is full of stone and glass, but Salisbury Cathedral stands on its flat plain as a stunning and eternal surprise. And so one of the things that Heinlein is constantly trying to, to do is, is you know, um, epitele gauchiste. Uh, he's not into, you know, he's, he doesn't want to shock the bourgeoisie, he wants to make the, the left wake up. And so even though he's talking from a highly conservative position, he, he, he's always addressing the left. He's a person who would much rather go to, um, go to a party and argue with a bunch of smart socialists than hang out with the libertarians and the republicans who he's actually committed to. At that 75 banquet, <coughs> SFWA, Nebula Banquet, they gave Heinlein the Grand Master. And after the ceremony, after the evening, Heinlein was just sitting in a chair with his huge ornament beside him and accepting, you know, a long winding line of people just to wish him well and talk to him. And Bester was on him and I found myself behind Bester. And some guy came over and said to Bester, if you're very good, maybe someday they'll give you one of those. And I went crazy. You have the gall to come here and patronize and condescend to Alfred Bester, the author of The Demolished Man. Who the hell do you think? And, and I began to rave. And Bester put a hand on my arm and with infinite wisdom said, Barry, it's okay, Barry. Let it go. So I let it go. How fortunate I was that from the word go, I was predisposed to write science fiction. And although I've written other things, uh, there is, of course, a particular undeniable cachet about writing science fiction. And all those of us involved with it know what that is. The best science fiction stories end with the world irredeemably changed. It's just like the real world. Even the young Turk can become the old buffer. <laughs>